Hello and good morning and welcome to Story Church's final digital gathering. It, this is week number 26 of gathering online and next week we'll be back in person. Before we rush to the, the in-person announcement, let us just celebrate that for 26 weeks, God has done some incredible work. He has saved people, he has grown people, he has drawn people to himself and he has increased the ministry of Story Church. And not only that, but we wanna celebrate the faithfulness of a large group of volunteers who came week in and week out and sacrificed their Saturday mornings to produce this digital gathering. So hop on that chat there on YouTube, send a text message, uh, call someone and pray for them and thank them for their service. So uh, now, but before I get any further, if you're new to Story Church, I just want to send a special welcome to you. My name's Travis Cunningham. I serve as one of the pastors here at Story Church. And Story Church, we exist to know, live, and share the one true story. That one true story being the gospel of Jesus Christ, that drives everything we do, every decision we make. We wanna draw you into the love of our savior, Jesus Christ. So if you are new to Story Church, uh, visit our website, download our app, and fill out a digital connect card. Let us know who you are, any questions you have, and the ways in which we can serve you in this season. Additionally, we've got a prayer line. You'll see a number on your screen that you can text to pray. We love to pray at Story Church week in and week out. We gather to pray over the different praises and petitions of our people. So join them and let us pray alongside you. Now, you heard me say it. Next week, we're gonna gather in person. 9 a.m. back at our church building in the north parking lot. We would love for you to come. Visit our, our social media pages, Instagram and Facebook. Share Share the announcement, invite your friends, invite your family, come. You'll, you'll see a landing page on our website that has all the questions that you need answered before you come. But most importantly, do everything you can to be there. The biggest piece missing in my life in the last six months has been the weekly gathering with the other saints uh, here at Story Church. So I'm so excited to get back. We need this. And so I wanna invite you to come and to join us and invite your friends to join you. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and turn our attention to the Lord in worship. morning, church. This morning's call to worship is from Hebrews 4, uh, verses 14 through 16, and it reads like this. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this morning, I want to encourage you guys to, to sing out, um, to focus on the lyrics of the songs um, and be encouraged by them as we have a great high priest that has stood for us, that we're able to enter into the throne room of grace. Um, so sing out this morning and um, be encouraged by these words. Show me 
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. So 
placed this breath in our lungs, and for that alone, you deserve our praise and our worship. Um, but beyond that, you conquered sin and death, that which separated us from you, Lord. We thank you, God, and we praise you this morning as we enter into a time of studying your word. We pray, God, that you would open our eyes to see you, to see the grace, the love, and the mercy that you have for us. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, go ahead and grab your Bibles and join me in Exodus chapter 28. We're going to be in chapters 28, 29, 30, and 31 today, so we've got a lot of ground to cover. Today's sermon title is Saved and Sent, Jesus, 
our priest and our rest. Jesus is our priest and our rest. So, so my wife, Katie, and I, we love watching TV series together. Particularly, we love watching shows that are thriller or suspense. We love the unpredictability, the plot twists, the turns, and, and how we just don't know how things are gonna work out. However, the dark side to watching those shows with my wife, I, I love her, all right, so I'll just caveat it with that. I love my wife. The dark side is that my wife is full of questions. She peppers me with questions immediately. So I have to have my, my remote ready to hit pause at any given uh, moment's notice. So we might be three minutes into the, the first episode of a new series and she'll be hitting me with questions like, who's that? I don't know who that person is. Did they introduce that character yet? Do you think this person's gonna live? I don't know what's going on here. So I always just have to press pause, answer her question, and usually it goes like this. Listen, Katie, I've been watching this show as long as you have. I know as much as you do. I bet if we just wait, the director uh, will create some story and we'll get there eventually. Now, I share that because a lot of times when we approach our Bibles, we come with questions like that. I don't know what's going on here. Who's that? What is that phrase? What is that topic? What is that concept, and those are great questions to ask. But, but sometimes when my wife and I are watching a show, if it doesn't develop quickly enough, uh, we'll just kind of give up because the questions are too many. And a lot of times in our Bible reading, we'll just give up, and we won't press in, and we won't do the hard work. Now, when we get into the New Testament, we read a lot of different concepts and phrases, and we see those things, and we think, what does this mean? And the best way to interpret the New Testament is to go into the Old Testament and see what the Old Testament is teaching about these different topics. Now, I share all that to say that today we're going to encounter three topics in particular that are all over the New Testament that at times can be confusing to you and confusing to me and confusing to all of us. So we're going to see the topic of the high priest. We're going to learn about the priesthood of all believers, and we're going to learn about our Sabbath. And, and so what I want to do is just explore each of these topics and show you how the New Testament authors use those and how they all point to Jesus. All right, so, so let's move into this together. The first topic we're going to encounter in chapter 28 is the high priest. So, so here's the role of the high priest in one sentence. The high priest represents the people of God before God. So the high priest represents Israel before God. So let me show you how this works as we turn our attention to God's word. Grab your Bibles and look at chapter 28 verses 1 through 5 with me. This is God speaking to Moses. He says to Moses, Then bring near to you Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make. A breast, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. All right, so, so here's what, what we have going on here. I'm, I'm naturally just kind of a person who's a little bit anti-authority. I bristle at someone coming in and telling me what to do, which I'm sure none of you have ever picked up on, uh, but Believe it or not, in high school, I told my baseball coach that he needs to step aside and let me coach the team, and, and I was a sophomore at this point. So that's just kind of how arrogant, really, I am. So let me p uh, paint a picture of a scenario. Let's say I'm standing outside of a building, and there's kind of smoke billowing forth from it. I'm pretty curious as a person, so I begin approaching that building, getting ready to go inside that building and see what's going on there. If an individual came up to me wearing just kind of plain street clothes, and he said to me, hey, that building's on fire. You probably shouldn't go in there because of kind of this anti-authority streak in me, I would, I would tell him, who are you? You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to explore and see what's going on. Now, within that same scenario, let's say a firefighter came up to me, and he's in full uniform, and he says to me, hey, don't go in that building because it's on fire. You know what I do? 
I'd stand down. Why? Well, because the firefighter in his uniform is not just a a random guy in plain street clothes. And his uniform shows us his authority. It shows us his role, his expertise, his education, his life experience fighting fire. And he knows that something dangerous is going on in that building. So I'll stand down and respect him because of his authority. Now, Now, I share that because what we have here in chapter 28 is God speaking to Moses saying, here is the uniform, so to speak, for Aaron and his sons and for all the high priests that are going to come after him. And this uniform represents the role and the authority and the calling and the education and the expertise that the high priest would have in their job of representing Israel before God. So what I want to do is just show you a little bit of the few different angles of what it means for Aaron and his sons to be the high priest. So here's your first note. The high priest is consecrated for service to God, service before God. They're set apart for service before God. We see this in verses one through three, where God is calling Aaron and his sons out from among the people of Israel and saying, you are gonna serve me as priest. You see it right there at the end of verse three, to consecrate him for my priesthood. At the end of verse four, call Aaron and Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priests. God has set his sights on Aaron and his sons and said, I will set you apart, make you holy, and you will be my priests doing the work of my priests. And within the garments and the uniform that the high priest would wear, we learn a little bit about what the priest would do. So here's what we're going to do. In just a second, I'm going to throw a chart on the screen, and that's going to have the different aspects of the uniform or or the robe of a priest. And then it's going to talk about the scripture that references it. And later on in the book, in chapter 39, when it actually gets fulfilled and Aaron and his sons put the high priestly robe on, and then the purpose of that particular item. Okay, so, so walk with me through this. Look at this chart. We have first an ephod that's referenced. This is in chapter 28, verses 6 through 14, later on fulfilled filled in chapter 39. And the ephod is meant to show the role and the position as high priest. This was made with the finest of linens, the finest of materials, and it showed just how uh, called and ordained this high priest would be as he walked around the camp of Israel in this robe, the only one in it, the one set apart as the high priest. And not only that, but on the ephod, there would be the, the names of the different tribes of Israel that this high priest represented. So every time he went into the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies, he carried with him the 12 tribes of Israel as their representative. So the high priest is first a representative of the people. Next, we encounter the breast piece. The breast piece is found there in chapter 28, verses 15 through 30. So there would be two pouches on the breast piece of the, of the high priest. And in one of the pouches, it had four different so- stones in sets of three. So again, this is the 12 tribes of Israel. And what he would do is he would carry the breast piece into the Holy of Holies and make intercession on behalf of those 12 tribes. So they, the high priest would know the needs and the wants and the desires of all of Israel, and they would bring those needs and wants and desires before God and before the Holy of Holies as he carried those stones in. And then on the other pouch, there there was different stones, uh, and and what those stones represented was the decision-making that the priest would do. So the needs of the people would come to the priest and he would grab the stones and he would cast lots. And in, in casting lots, this wasn't about chance or, or gambling or whatever else. It was about submitting decisions before God and pleading with God for his wisdom and trusting that God has a sovereignty down to the smallest events of casting of lots. So when the needs and intercession were brought before the people, they, they, were cast, they would cast lots and trust God with the decision that was made. Next, we learn of the robe. This is in chapter 28, 31 through 35. And the robe symbolizes the need that Israel had for a mediator. Here's why I say that. At the edge of the robe, there would be little bells that would jingle as the priest walked. And as the priest would walk and approach 
further and further into the tabernacle, the jingle would get louder. In a sense, it would go up to God's ears, so to speak, and God would hear the mediator approaching him, not because God was unaware, not because God didn't see, but because the high priest recognized that he was a sinful and fallen man, and to just flippantly approach the holy of holies, he would be consumed by the holiness of God. So he needed to warn God, so to speak, representing I'm coming here as a mediator to seek your forgiveness, to seek your grace, and to seek your presence. Next, uh, what's listed is the turban and the tunic and the sash. That's in chapter 28, verses 36 through 41. And what what the turban and tunic and sash represented is bringing gifts before God. Again, this was made with the gold and the scarlet and the fine twined linens, all these things that God had graciously given to Israel. And now God is saying, construct this for the high priest and bring it back to me as the priest approaches me. And what they were recognizing is that God gives and we give back to God. That everything Israel had was a gracious gift by the hand of God and the high priest is saying, God, we will use all of this to glorify you, all of this to worship you, and all of it truly belongs to you. We don't own this, we steward this. And then finally, we encounter the holy garments or the holy underwear in today's work. This is in our words. This is chapter 28, 42 and 43. And this symbolizes God's gracious covering of his people's sin and shame. So if we go back to the garden account in chapters one and two of Genesis, what we learn is that Adam and Eve, before sin entered the world, uh, they were naked and unashamed before God. They didn't see their, sin, their, their flaws. They didn't see their fallenness because sin hadn't entered the picture yet. But the second they sinned, the second they fell, what happened was they noticed their nakedness. They noticed their sinfulness. They had an acute awareness of how much shame they were carrying. And what God does in Genesis chapter three in the first gospel is what he, he, he does a sacrifice and he covers Adam and Eve and he covers their nakedness. And in doing that, he forgives their sin and he covers their shame. And so when the high priest is wearing these undergarments, what he's saying is, as your people, we are not full of shame and we are not full of sin before you because you have graciously granted us forgiveness and you have graciously removed shame from our lives. So all in all, this high priest was an intercessor and a mediator and a representative of Israel before God. And as he approached God, he brought with him, again, all of the needs and the wants and the desires of Israel. All of this points to the need that Israel had for a high priest. Why? Because they were an unrighteous people standing before a righteous God. And the priest would be the one who was consecrated, set apart, and holy to do the work of bringing them before God. So then the question becomes, how? Were Aaron, were his sons, were they sinless and blameless and perfect? And again, the Bible will say no to us. And next week, as we look at chapter 32, we will see just how sinful even the high priest was as they construct a golden calf for the people of Israel to worship. So Aaron and his sons were sinful and fallen just like the rest of Israel. So how did the high priests become holy? Well, the high priests were made holy by God. This was an external holiness. The high priest could not make themselves holy. What they needed was a God to come in and make them holy and righteous so that they could enter into his presence, bringing all of Israel with them as their representative. So how does God do this? Well, God accomplishes this in several ways. Grab your Bibles and flip with me to Exodus 29. Exodus 29, we're gonna read verses one through seven. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, speaking of the priests, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head 
and anoint him. So what we see is God washing Aaron and his sons in water, cleansing them of their unrighteousness. We we see God uh, putting their garments on, symbolizing their calling. And then we see God anointing the priests with oils, symbolizing their ordination to be priests. But most importantly, we see three different sacrifices performed here, one of the bull and two of the rams. And we will see this, this sacrificial system expanded upon in the book of Leviticus. But let me just explain to you a little bit of what we see here in its first fruits. The first one, the bull of the herd would be sacrificed. And this is what is called a sin offering. What happens is Aaron and the high priest, they would grab a bull without blemish. They would lay their hands on the bull. And in laying their hands on the bull, they would be transferring their sin onto that bull. Then they would put the bull on the altar and sacrifice it as the bull would bear the weight of their penalty and punishment for their sinfulness. So their sin gets transferred to the bull and the bull takes their punishment. So now they, the the high priests, are cleansed of their sin, made holy, made righteous because of this sin offering. And then we see the first of the two rams, and this is called a burnt offering. The first ram, what would happen is that ram would be sacrificed and then they would throw it into a fire and it would be consumed by the fire. And then the, the smoke would billow up to the nostrils of God and it would be a sweet aroma in, in, in the smell of God, symbolizing that the people or the high priests are now pleasing a sweet aroma before God. This is a burnt offering. So not only are the priests now forgiven because of the sin offering, they're now pleasing in the sight of God because of the, of the burnt offering. And then the second of the two bulls is called a pe- or, or, uh, rams is called a peace offering. And what would happen in this offering is that they would sacrifice the ram, they would parcel up bits and pieces of it, and then the priesthood, they would set down and they would eat that ram, symbolizing the peace they now have with God. If you remember back to last week, when with God's invitation to hospitality, we sit at his table and we feast with him, saying we have harmony with God, peace with God. We, we are not enemies of God, but we are reconciled to God. So that's what this peace offering represented. So through these three different offerings, the priests were forgiven and made holy. They were pleasing in the sight of God, and now they were 100% at peace with God. So so this, this sacrifice was done uh, each day for one week and it was all done that the high priest would made, be made holy so that the high priest could then go represent Israel before God. And then we go into the New Testament and we read all over the New Testament this concept of the high priest and particularly in the book of Hebrews. You heard it in the call to worship from Hebrews chapter four that Jesus is our high priest. What does this mean? Well, this means that Jesus is perfectly holy and consecrated. He is set apart to be our representative. And it's not because he had to be made holy. It's because he lived a holy and perfect life. We learn that Jesus is anointed at his baptism to accomplish the work of salvation, the work that we need done for us. Jesus is anointed to do that work as our high priest. It means that Jesus now represents us before God at the right hand of the throne. And what what he does there is he mediates a way for us into God's presence. We learn that Jesus intercedes on our behalf as our high priest. He lives to always make intercession for us, praying and bringing all of our wants and needs and desires before the Father. And then finally, Jesus is our sin offering, the one who our sin was transferred to and his righteousness was transferred to us. He is our burnt offering, making us pleasing in the sight of God. And he is our peace offering where he invites us to sit at his table and dine with him forever. No longer enemies of God, but now children of God. This is what it means for Jesus to be our high priest. So if the high priest represents the people of God before God, Jesus is our representative bringing everything before God. So what's the invitation there? It's to be honest. It's to run to Jesus. Jesus is not shocked by you. He's not surprised by you. He's not let down by you. But he calls us to bring everything to him in prayer. Confess our sin. Recognize our wounds. Seek healing. Seek comfort in the midst of affliction. Seek strength in the midst of suffering. And Jesus, as our high priest, brings that before the Father. And through Jesus, we have this great gift. So first, we learn about the high priest, Jesus, our high priest, who is calling us, come to me, come to me. 
Next, we're going to jump into chapter 31, and we're going to learn about the priesthood of all believers. So grab your Bible, chapter 31. We're going to read verses 1 through 6, and there's going to be some names in here. Don't, don't make fun of me as I try to pronounce them. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by my name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Ohalab, the son of Ahishmach, uh, that's a guess there, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they make all that they make all that I have commanded you. So after we read about the high priest, what's natural to think through the book of Exodus is, is Moses is special and Aaron and his sons are special. They're so much different than the rest of Israel. Everyone else in Israel must have less value and less gifting than Aaron and Moses. And the Bible just doesn't have a category for that. But the Bible will say, if you're a part of the people of God, everyone is equally valuable, equally necessary, equally gifted, equally empowered by the Spirit of God. Did you see it in there in chapter 31? I have filled them with the Spirit, God says. Why? To do the work of ministry. This Bible tackles what we call the sacred-secular divide, that pastors are doing this sacred work that's supremely important, and it's absolutely an important work, and that everyone else who's in the secular Secular world is doing less important work. And the Bible will say that's just simply not true. But Christians full of the Spirit of God, armed with the Word of God, are called to, to all be priests, to all do the work of the ministry. I love this passage. It's so cool that these guys, without these names listed here, that the robe wouldn't be built, the tabernacle wouldn't be built, the artistic design wouldn't be there, the beauty wouldn't be there, all of the ability and the knowledge and the craftsmanship would be missing. And Moses and Aaron wouldn't be able to do their jobs without these people. And then we remember back to Exodus chapter 19, which we read a few weeks ago, which says to us, God, God's speaking to his people, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. All of Israel, kingdom of priests. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And then again, we go into the New Testament and we read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, speaking to the church, which says, But you, church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This section is about the priesthood of all believers in every member ministry of Israel and in every member ministry of Story Church. So if I could just sum it up again in one sentence, the priesthood of believers means this. All of our life is service to God. Everything we do is service to God. We all have places we live, places we rest, places we frequent, places we drink coffee at, places we play, neighborhoods we live in, places we go to work at. And what, I, what you need to know, church, is that the Christian life is not a compartmentalized life. In other words, you're not a Christian only on Sunday mornings when you come to church and, and Wednesday nights when you go to home group and a couple times a month when you join the prayer meeting, but the rest of the week when you're at work, when you're in your neighborhood, when you're with your children, you're no longer a Christian but rather the Bible will say that your primary identity is a Christian before God and that supersedes everything and God has gifted you and wired you and filled you with his spirit so that every aspect of your life can be used for his glory, for his name, and for the work of advancing the gospel. So again, this kind of just destroys the sacred secular divide. All of our lives must be offered up in service to God. Whether we're bankers, pastors, computer programmers, doctors, janitors, teachers, stay-at-home moms, retirees, or anything else, we are all called to be priests and we are all called to serve God. So how can we do this? How can we be the priesthood of all believers? Let me just offer up four quick tips and you're gonna hear these and you're gonna say, that's, that's it? It's that simple, and, and, and yes, the Bible will say it's that simple. So, so let me hit four things for us real quick. Number one, love God in all we do. 
Our primary aim should be loving God, honoring his name, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. We understand that as his people, we now represent him everywhere we go, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our churches, and everywhere else we are bearing the name of God and we represent him and we are called to love him with every aspect of our lives, heart, mind, soul, and strength. So we make this our primary aim and everything else is downhill from that. The second thing we are called to do is love our neighbors in all that we do. So the greatest commandment according to Jesus is not just to love God, but it's to love neighbor as well. And when Jesus was asked in the New Testament, who's my neighbor? He just says, everyone, everyone is your neighbor. Anyone who bears the image of God, every human is your neighbor and they are all worthy of dignity, honor, respect, love, and, and, and to be treated as God's creation, God's image bearers. So how can we love our neighbors in such a way that we live out the priesthood of all believers? We'll be people of character, people of integrity, be honest, treat people well, talk to people kindly, help other people, care for other people. The life you live is a visible life, not a hidden life. And we are called to love our neighbors everywhere we go, even and especially the ones we don't like. Number three, serve anyone, serve everyone in all that we do. I, I try to say this as often as I can at Story Church. Uh, you're not in first place in your own life. You're not even in second place in your own life. God is first, others are second, you come in last. So what does this mean? We act like Jesus. We lay our lives down for the sake of others. We seek to serve others and meet needs. We seek to humble ourselves for the interests of others, not the interests of self. We put off arrogant lifestyles, prideful lifestyles that are focused on self, self-centered lifestyles, narcissistic lifestyles. We lay that down at the foot of the cross and we pursue a life of serving others, helping others. Why? So they might see Jesus in us and want in on that. And then number four, produce good and beauty in all that we do. Uh, again, if we think back to the garden account, we see God creating. And in God creating, he made everything out of nothing with a word. He made order out of chaos. He made beauty out of vast, empty nothingness. And then he creates humans and he says, you now bear my image. In other words, you now reflect me to a lost and dying world. Well, well if we think we're made in the image of God, well, what does that mean? Well, we, we become like God, we reflect God, so we create order out of chaos. We create beauty out of empty nothingness. We create good in a world of hostility. This is what we are called to do. Even in chapter 31, we see God emphasizing artistic design. Listen, Christians should be producing the best music, the best entertainment, the best artwork, the best poetry on earth. I can't believe some of the trash we put out. Let us pursue beauty, church. Let us pursue good in all that we do. Again, this doesn't matter what you do. If you're a banker, do good and produce beauty as you bank. If you're a computer programmer, if you're a stay-at-home mom, wherever you find yourself, whatever God has called you to, as you produce good and as you produce beauty in this world that lacks those two things, people are going to see this, want in on this, be drawn to the love of Jesus Christ through your ministry. It's that simple, church. Love God, love neighbor, serve all, produce good and beauty. This is how we are equipped for every day, every member, member ministry. Let me sum up the priesthood of believers this way. Everyday Christianity is ordinary living with gospel intentionality. You, you see, the priesthood of all believers will say that there are certainly some people that are called to be missionaries and to, to go to far away places and give their lives, but, but every Christian is called to be a missionary. So just live your ordinary life. If you teach, teach as a missionary. If you're an owner of a company, own that company as a missionary through a missional lens. Live all of life with gospel intentionality. What does that mean? It means look for opportunities to pray for others to speak truth to others, to be kind to others, to share the love of Jesus with others. Live your life above reproach and with integrity. Live all of life with gospel intentionality. It's not radical, it's ordinary. And we're all invited into this. So we learn first about the high priest. Then we learn about the priesthood of all believers. The final thing we'll learn in this section is about the Sabbath rest. Look at chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. 
Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rest, rested and was refreshed. And when we think about the Sabbath in our own lives, uh, verse 13 here in chapter 31 says, they did the Sabbath to remember the Lord. This is why we Sabbath, to remember the Lord. And when we Sabbath, we are doing one of the greatest acts of faith we can do in our world. A world gone mad with busyness, a world gone mad with uh, our overscheduled calendars, a world gone mad with trying too hard to do too much and always tired, always busy, always paranoid. And when we Sabbath, what we're doing is stepping back and saying, you're God, I'm not. When I'm sleeping, you're not. When I'm not working, you're active. What we are doing is remembering the Lord in our rest. And if God himself rested, we as creation must rest and must tr trust the Lord. So, so let me give you just a few ways in which we can Sabbath to the glory of God, church. Uh, number one, Sabbath actively, Sabbath actively in your life. The Sabbath is not meant to be a vegetative state where we just sit back and binge watch Netflix all day long. The Sabbath is an active discipline. Think about fasting for a second. When you fast from food, what you're doing is taking something from yourself and creating desire and hunger within you for food. And then you're filling that desire and that hunger with the Lord as you pray, as you read his word, as you worship. And this is what the Sabbath is as well. As we relent from working and we clear up our calendars, what we're doing is we're not clearing our calendars up just to simply to veg out, but we're clearing our calendars up to to make God our singular focus to pursue him only, to worship him, to read his word, to have dinner with friends, to have honest heart level conversation with those in our lives that we trust, to pray and to consider the Lord as the only focus in our life on that day. It must be an active discipline where we are focusing on God. We will get so much more out of it if we rest actively. Number two, Sabbath intentionally. Have a plan for your Sabbath. Uh, Katie and I, uh, when date nights used to be a thing uh, before shutdown, uh, what we would do is we would schedule a babysitter. We'd have that sitter for, I don't know, three hours or something like that. And, and then as the sitter would come, we'd hop in my truck and we'd begin driving. And then we'd get to that conversation where it's like, what are we having for dinner? We'd pull up Yelp and we'd frantically be searching for where we wanted to eat that night. And we'd cut into half of our time just searching for a place to eat. And we wasted so much of our time. And, and I think that's what a lot of us do when we have our Sabbath day. We wake up and wonder, what, what am I going to do today? How am I going to fill my time today? And we waste half the day wondering what we're going to do. Instead, we're called the Sabbath intentionally, where we set aside time and books and, and people that we want to spend time with, and we actively pursue those things with intentionality. Uh, I heard something that really helped me in my own Sabbath rest. Uh, I heard if you do physical work, if you do hands work all week long, what you can do is step back and do mind work with your Sabbath. In other words, if you're someone who's a plumber and you're working hard all week long, well, on your Sabbath day, it's best for you to read and to pray and to listen to music and, and not just burn your, or work yourself to, to your knuckles too hard with your hands. But on the other hand, if you do mind work all week long, like, like me, if you're in books and on computers, if, you're some, do, if you do something like that we're called to sabbath with our hands do physical work so what it looks like for me is i get out in my trash can of a backyard i throw some headphones in i put some good worship music or a sermon on or or the dwell bible app and i listen to scripture and i begin doing work in my backyard and that's how i'm sabbathing and pursuing the lord through this physical work if you need help designing a sabbath let us know we'd walk with you along alongside you in that and then number three sabbath regularly don't be rigid with the Sabbath. Again, we, we live in a world that's different than the ancient world. And so you don't have to be rigid and say it's every Saturday, no matter what, orient your expectations that, that the rhythm is gonna be changing and, and it's gonna be fluid and dynamic over time. Uh, but, but what you must do is work ahead, put it on your calendar, and then honor it. Make sure it's a regular part of your life where you're saying no to good things in order to say yes to the best thing, which is resting in God.
And if we think about the concept of Sabbath overall, Jesus is our Sabbath rest, where the greatest work that we need done in our lives is the work of reconciliation to God, where we were his enemies in our sin, and Jesus, through his, li- his perfect life and his substitutionary death and his powerful resurrection, he accomplishes that work for us, and he reconciles us back to the Father where we're no longer enemies of God, but now we're friends of God, children of God. This is the work that Jesus has done, and so what we can do is rest in him. We don't have to go prove ourselves to anyone. We don't have to go earn anything. Listen, no amount of money that you could work seven days a week to try and earn will ever satisfy you in a way that only Jesus can. No amount of climbing a corporate ladder will will truly be enough. Only Jesus will be enough. Only Jesus can truly be our Sabbath rest. And so we must do is step back, take a day off, rest in him and trust God. So this section, it's about the high priest, it's about the priesthood of all believers, it's about the Sabbath rest. And just like last week when we looked at the tabernacle, all of this is all about Jesus. Jesus is our high priest who mediates a way for us into God's presence that we might be forgiven, we might be at peace with God, and we might be pleasing in the sight of God. Jesus is the one who equips us with his spirit, calls us into ministry and says, wherever you go, I am going with you. You have the gospel, you have the spirit of God, you are called to ministry. And then Jesus is our Sabbath rest, where when he cried out on the cross, it is finished. We trust him that it's done. We no longer need to add anything to the work of Jesus to attain salvation, but rather Jesus alone has accomplished it in our place. This section is all about the people of God trusting in Jesus. So that's the invitation we're going to extend this morning. Have you trusted in Jesus? If you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, have you for the first time seen your sin, turned from your sin, and and, and said, Jesus, be my high priest. Bring me into the presence of God. I trust in you that you are my sin offering, and through you and you alone, I can be forgiven. And at that moment's notice, your sin will be transferred to Jesus and his work on the cross, and his righteousness will be gifted to you, and you will have the fully and finished work of Jesus Christ forever forgiven because of him, and then you can rest in him. Christian, the invitation is to trust in Jesus. Again, keep on trusting Jesus, not just in the big thing like your salvation, but in all things, in all of your life. So as you Sabbath, you are doing the greatest act of faith and trusting that Jesus is your provider, that he will give you all that you need. Trust in Jesus that as you cry out to him, he is making intercession for you before the Father. Trust in Jesus that as you go and live on a mission, as a missionary on his behalf, that he will work through you. He is always working in you and through you and around you and among all of us. So we are called to trust in Jesus, to relent from trying to earn what has already been gifted to us in his gospel. This is the invitation. Have you trusted in Jesus? Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you that uh, you have given us a high priest in Jesus, that when we couldn't earn our way into your presence, he made the way as our sin offering, our burnt offering, and as our peace offering. We thank you that all of our wants and our needs and our desires, they go up to Jesus and Jesus brings them before you. And every prayer we pray is good enough because Jesus, our high priest, is good enough. We thank you that that when we live this life as the priesthood of all believers, we're not doing this on our own, but your spirit is with us, your word is with us, and the powerful gospel is active among us. And God, we thank you for the Sabbath rest that you have designed and modeled for us, where we can step back and trust in you, that you can accomplish more in six days than we can in seven. So God, I pray for anyone out there, and the sound of my voice, if they're not a believer, God, would you draw them to yourself for the first time, show them your beauty and your good, and save them, Lord, as they turn from their sin and trust in you. For, for the people of Story Church, God, I pray you give us more and more confidence in the finished work of Jesus, that we don't need to earn what we already have in him, and that we can go out and proclaim his excellencies wherever we find ourselves. God, will you do this work, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Now, church, as always, we're going to transition to a time of giving, and, and you'll see on your screen the different ways that you can give to Story Church. Uh, let me just continue to suggest, go on our website, hit the Give button, set up recurring digital giving. That helps us best plan into the future how we can live out the mission of God here at Story Church. But, but as I say each week, uh, more important than how we give is why we give, and we give out of a heart of trusting in Jesus. If the Sabbath rest is one of the greatest acts of faith we can do in our modern day. Generosity is right up there with it. As we say, God, you can do more in six days than we can do in seven as we Sabbath. When we give generously to God, we say, God, you can do more in my life with 90% of my income than I can ever accomplish with 100% of my income. And never mind that extra 10%, man, it goes forth and it preaches the gospel through the every member ministry of Story Church and churches around the globe that we support. This is an act of faith where we are trusting in Jesus actively and intentionally and sacrificially and generously that God might be glorified and people everywhere might hear of this good news that Jesus has accomplished for us what we can never accomplish on our own. So Story Church, again, we're proud of you. We thank you for your continued generous giving to the mission here at Story Church and we're praying for all the more of that. One more prayer with me. Father, we love you. Thank you for your generosity to us in Jesus Christ. I pray you would use us to be a radically generous people, making the gospel go forth through our missionary ammunition called money. Would you use that money so that people might be saved, they might grow, and, and churches might be planted, missionaries might be sent, and, and Jesus might be exalted over the entire world. Father, we love you. In Christ's name, amen.
the King of glory. You are the Lord of all. Jesus, better than anything this life has to offer, God, you are everything. And we thank you and praise you for that fact. Now, if you would stand, we're going to sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom Blessings flow this passage over you from Jude verses 24 through 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Well, church, we've been saying we'll see you next week, every week for the past 26 weeks, and we are actually going to see you next week. We cannot wait to gather in person together for our outdoor service. And so bring your family, bring some chairs, bring something to cover your head to deal with the sun, and just bring bring yourselves. Be ready to worship, to take communion, to hear God's word preached, to proclaim the gospel to one another and to the neighborhood that our church is in. We are so excited to see you. We cannot wait. So we will see you next week.